Okay, so here we are at the introductory ch chapter. We're going to talk about exactly what science is and a little bit about how it's going to apply to some things that we're going to investigate throughout the semester. Now, understanding science, you need to actually look at what happened before science took its modern form. A lot of times we say that uh, science in its modern form really didn't uh, happen until Galileo and uh, the Renaissance. So, uh, looking before science, we should understand that um, any time that we're trying to gain understanding about the world around us, about our experiences around us, that is really philosophy, the attempt to understand. And science is both a natural philosophy and also a natural curiosity that we have about uh, looking at, at nature examining it and recognizing patterns. Now, very important in science, you'll hear this term empirical evidence. Um, a lot of times when people are you know, discussing uh, debunked theories, they'll say, well, there's no empirical evidence to support it. It's just a very fancy way of saying an observable. You know, empirical evidence is something that we can observe, something through our senses, and therefore uh, support a particular idea that we might have. So most empirical evidence today is obtained through an experiment and that's really what makes it scientific. But we have been observing nature for quite some time and for some very important reasons. Now, if we look at ancient astronomy, astronomy which existed even before civilization, structures like Stonehenge uh, show us that prehistoric people actually understood the idea of the seasons and by observing the heavens and recognizing the patterns they were able to keep track of time specifically they were able to keep track of the seasons and this was very important for uh, harvesting. Now we understand that the original uh, people were actually you know as we say hunter-gatherers basically knowing the correct time when to plant, when to harvest was not just a matter of success, it was a matter of survival, the ultimate success. So the difference between success and starvation was knowing exactly what time of year it was, um, getting the crops in after the last frost has occurred, and also understanding that you need to harvest before a particular time. So studying the heavens, knowing um, how the sun's shadows would fall, at a particular time of the year was very, very important to early humans. With the advent of civilizations, the understanding of the, the heavens improved even more. The ancient Egyptians used astronomy to predict the uh, arrival of the seasonal floods. The Nile would uh, basically flood due to the meltwaters of mountains south of um, Egypt. And um, essentially, seeing the star Sirius rise at a particular time would tell them that the floods were coming. They also used a lot of this pattern recognition to, to incorporate it into their, their religion. So there's a mystical um, connection that they made. This is the constellation that we know as Orion. It was known as Osiris by the ancient Egyptians. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, which I mentioned, uh, was connected with Isis. And it's even thought that the, so the shafts of the pyramid were aligned with particular constellations at, at a certain time of the year. Now, we look at um, natural philosophy and science from a very Eurocentric standpoint. Certainly, many other cultures had uh, influence in the way that we think about science today. Uh, but, you know, History is what it is, and it, the way it's taught, there is a very um, Eurocentric uh, approach to it. So we see that um, it began with the ancient Greeks, and um, the ancient Greeks uh, were really one of the first to uh, attempt to understand the world around them uh, using logic and reasoning rather than uh, mystical uh, understanding. Again, this is what we call philosophy, an attempt to understand 
what's going on basically through, through logic. It's uh, thought that Thales, although the first Greek philosophers, there's really no written record uh, of them, and we can't even be sure that some of them uh, even existed. However, the uh, traditions that were passed on uh, from, from one person to another uh, give us the stories that we understand today. Uh, and those are Thales and Pythagoras. Thales is credited with being the first ancient Greek philosopher um, who, uh, again, attempted this naturalistic view of the world rather than this mystic view of the world. That, again, there were physical processes that were at play rather than you know, gods and goddesses calling the action. Pythagoras uh, was really the founder of a cult of mathematicians, if you will, and uh, the followers of Pythagoras believed that the secrets of the physical world could be obtained by looking at mathematical relationships. He saw a very strong mathematical connection between music. Um, you know, certainly when we look at uh, you know, certain musical skill, scales, we see these ratios were very, very important to developing uh, things like a diatonic scale. Um, and of course, uh, he felt that, uh, or the followers of Pythagoras, someone thought that there was a mystical, there's a magical um, property to mathematics. Now again, there is nothing math magical about mathematics. It is just a tool that we use today to uh, help us with science, but you know, we can thank some of that connection going back to Pythagoras and Pythagoras using math to understand, you know, such things as uh, musical scales and, and the harp. Socrates is uh, one of the, I guess he called it the three big philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and, and Aristotle. And um, again, uh, we know that science evolved from a natural philosophy, a branch of philosophy known as natural philosophy. And um, one of the important contributions to inquiry uh, that Socrates made was, of course, the Socratic method. And we examine issues by trying to prove them wrong to establish their validity. Why is this important? Because part of the scientific method is really to, uh, you know, falsifiability. If you're testing a hypothesis, it has to be falsifiable. There has to be the possibility that you could prove it wrong. And again, we can sort of go back to Socrates and his way of thinking um, in terms of, um, you know, using this logical approach. Plato was a student of Socrates, um, also very important. His ideas about metaphysics had a very profound effect on later Greek philosophers. In his cave allegory, uh, Plato questions the reality of the world, and um, basically, uh, in the cave allegory, if I, if I tell it correctly, he says we're very much like uh, prisoners or, or slaves chained to the, the wall of the cave where we only see the shadows of what is actually happening. And basically, uh, Plato was hinting that there's this underlying you know, uh, pattern Again, I guess this is very much connected with what uh, Pythagoras thought. This underlying pattern that we need to dig deeper in order to understand. The problem is this also made many Greek philosophers uh, view the world as corruptible, uh, just like the shadows on the cave's wall, and that uh, there's actually a pure form of the processes that would lead to what we see in the terrestrial world. That the celestial world, the heavens, were pure, unchanging, immutable, whereas in the case of the terrestrial world, they were a weak and um, feeble shadow of, of, of these uh, other truths. Aristotle was a student of Plato, and um, Aristotle made many contributions to logic, general philosophy, uh, government, um, contributed to the understanding of the universe. And, um, you know, he uh, promoted, he didn't develop, but he promoted a physical model of uh, the heavens, which became very, very popular. In fact, so ingrained that uh, 
it took Galileo and the Renaissance to completely overturn it. Um, one of the weaknesses of natural philosophy in this form was that the philosophers relied on deductive reasoning, basically just reasoning things out, using logic without experimentation. Again, going back to Plato's cave allegory, if you're doing experiments on an imperfect world, then um, your results are going to be imperfect. So um, the philosophers like Aristotle thought that you could just reason things out and arrive at the truth that way. We now know today that the experiment's a very powerful tool, again, you know, to test the falsifil to, to, you know, create the possibility of falsifying different ideas we come about. So, um, ancient Greek philosophers developed a, a wonderful system of, of logic, took the mathematics that the Egyptians and Babylonians had developed and, and advanced it even further. I mean, Euclid was a, a, you know, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. But they were sort of stuck in the idea where they couldn't get beyond um, you know, just using logic. They couldn't apply the experiment to test ideas the way that they should. Now, after the fall of the ancient Greeks, essentially Western civilization uh, was struck in sort of a rut. I mean, certainly the Roman Empire um, was a great power, was a great uh, architectural force, but didn't um, advance natural philosophy very far beyond what the ancient Greeks did. Um, eventually the Roman Empire falls in the West, the East actually flourishes. Um, you know, certainly if we go to the Far East, um, at this time, the, you know, the Chinese civilizations and the Indus civilizations were, were doing you know, very, very well. Um, in the Middle East, it is no, um, it's no accident that most of the star names are, are named after are, are Arabic names, because in the Middle East, that's where astronomy was continuing and, and was being advanced, um, as well as, as mathematics. But in the West, things were sort of falling apart with the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And it wasn't until the Renaissance that uh, Europe got its act together again. And uh, the Renaissance marked a transition um, in a number of things. Art, the art of Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, music was going through profound changes. Government was going through profound changes. General philosophy was going through profound changes. And this is where we see big changes in natural philosophy. Now, of course, Copernicus um, is going to come along at this time. And Copernicus is very famous for changing the geocentric model of the universe to the heliocentric model of the universe. But um, Copernicus really didn't advance the way science was done. Um, really, Galileo is known as the modern, the father of modern science, because he really, you know, Francis Bacon, of course, makes contributions here also, but uh, Galileo really makes the, the experiment a very, very important part of natural philosophy, and this is when we, we, we enter the realm of modern science. Now again, um, Galileo did not come up with a heliocentric model for the universe. Aristarchus, back in the ancient Greek time, uh, came up with one of the first models. Um, then, of course, Copernicus renews this idea with uh, his own model. But Galileo sets out not to come up with any new ideas, but to prove existing ideas that he supported were true. And this is where he used... Um, things such as the inclined plane and the telescope to make observations to refute what had been established by the ancient Greeks and other philosophers and to support this idea that the planets went around the sun, not the earth. Again, this is induction versus deduction. Here he's actually formulating an idea, observing natural patterns and from the natural patterns, drawing a conclusion, okay? The essence of science is that we use experiment to test our ideas.
And again, science requires experimental evidence. Um, at the time, things would fall too quickly for him to time them, so he used an inclined plane. Uh, but he basically came up with the idea that all things accelerate at the same rate if you eliminate all resistance. And he, he did this by rolling down um, marbles, essentially balls, down these inclined planes and showing that the rate of acceleration was constant. That no matter what the size of the, the marble was, it would always go down at the same rate. Okay, so what do we have? The difference between natural philosophy before and modern science today and from the Renaissance on was that natural philosophy, yes, used logic, could have used mathematics, could have used a number of other things. But it was science which used the experiment to basically test different ideas. Now the measurement is really the most important aspect of the experiment. So when we make a measurement, we are actually um, pr producing empirical evidence with quantities that we can then use to test our different ideas. So again, the measurement um, is uh, one of the most Im important aspects of, of any experiment that we do because it is the direct evidence that, that supports whatever idea we're trying to test. Now, unfortunately these days, there's been uh, quite a push by, I don't know what you'd call them, anti-intellectuals, uh, anti-science people you know, claiming that the Earth is flat. And of course, this is a, an absurd idea um, when we think about things, because going back to even the earliest civilizations, the earliest uh, sailors would look at the mass of ships and see the mass, you can actually see the mass of a ship sink over the horizon before the ship disappears. And it, it always you know, disappears at the same rate, or sinks at the same rate, showing that there's a constant curvature no matter what direction that you travel. Now, so the ancient Greeks understood that the Earth was, was spherical, and um, there's always this myth that uh, at the time that Columbus sailed the, the oceans, that uh, everybody thought the Earth was flat and that he was going to fall off. That's, you know, complete hogwash. But not only did the ancient Greeks understand that the Earth was spherical or a spheroid, the ancient Greeks actually set out to measure the size of the Earth. And Eratosthenes was the uh, first to actually do this. And he did it using very, very simple measurements. And this shows how powerful measurements can be. Um, he looked at the shadow uh, cast by objects at two different locations. Now, Rodothenes was actually in ancient Egypt, and this is at a time that Alexander the Great had already conquered Egypt, and I believe, um, given the, the time that Rodothenes was there, uh, the, the Roman Empire had, had actually taken over Egypt as a possession. So he makes a measurement, one at Alexandria, which was uh, the capital of Alexander the Great's old empire, and on the summer solstice, at noon, the shadow cast is about 7.2 degrees. Now, going down south to Siene, he notices that the shadow uh, of anything is uh, basically nothing, because it's sitting right on the Tropic of Cancer. Uh, at Siene, which is now the present-day location at the uh, Aswan Dam, uh, the sun rays would come down uh, exactly straight down. That's basically the location we call the, the uh, Tropic of, of Cancer. It is the location where the sun is exactly overhead on the summer solstice at noon. Well, looking at the difference, the 7 degrees versus the 0 degrees of the sunlight going down, he knew that these two locations, these two cities, represented 7 degrees on a 360 degree circle. So he could do a fraction here. He could do, you know, basically equate two ratios. He knew the distance between Alexandria and Siena, okay? That was well understood. Um, it was roughly about 800 uh, kilometers. And he knew the fractional distance on the circumference of the Earth, which was seven degrees 
over 360 degrees. And by setting those two ratios together, where the circumference was an unknown difference, he discovered that the circumference of the Earth was 40,000 kilometers. Again, two very simple measurements on the surface of the Earth without going up into space, without uh, traversing the entire circumference, just a small part, he had the size of the Earth. Aristarchus, the person who actually came up with the heliocentric model of the universe, extended our understanding even more. Through measurements of eclipses, Aristarchus was able to show that the eclipse of the moon in front of the Earth, what we call the solar eclipse, would come down to a point. It would go from one lunar diameter down to a point by the time it reaches Earth. It would lose one diameter of size. The lunar eclipse, when the Earth shadows the moon, that would drop to about three and a half times the diameter of the moon. So by very simple logic, he said, well, we lose one lunar diameter of width in these shadows. Okay? If the Earth's shadow drops down to three and a half times the size of the moon, the Earth must be, having lost one lunar diameter in its shadow, four and a half times bigger than the moon. Okay? So, uh, we know the size of the Earth by the previous measurement. We know the size of the moon compared to the Earth. And by then, looking at the size of the moon in the sky, we can come up with a whole bunch of other things by simple geometry. Okay? We know how big the moon is compared to the Earth. We know the distance by measuring the size of the moon. The moon is about half a degree um, when we look at the full, you know, 360 degrees of what the possible sky could be. You can actually see only 180 degrees. And again, um, all this information was known. Now, the one reason why Aristarchus believed that the sun was the center of the universe was when he did the same sort of measurements for the sun, he came up with a sun which was much bigger than the Earth and the moon. Didn't come up with this, the correct size. But using the first quarter, okay, where we can only see half of the face pointing toward us lit and the other half not lit, he used the simple process of cosines, where cosine is the adjacent side, okay, B in this particular case. This is the uh, distance with the line going from the Earth to the moon divided by C, which is the line between the sun and the earth, that when the moon is a first quarter or last quarter, okay, makes a 90 degree angle right here. We have a, a 90 degree triangle. So basically, he could measure the distance, this hypotenuse, by knowing the distance that he had already had between the earth and the moon, right? He knew that from the eclipses. And dividing that by the cosine of the angle, all right, which was the angle that the moon made in the sky. Now, unfortunately, this is very close to 90 degrees. So there's a tremendous amount of error in this. But when he did the calculations uh, for this, um, he came up with, well, a pretty good um, idea that uh, the sun was much, much bigger than um, the earth, much, much bigger than the moon. So Aristarchus results had the sun approximately 12 times larger than, than the moon, or about three and a half times larger than the Earth. Okay, it doesn't sound like a good result when we realize that actually the sun's about 100 times bigger. But again, there's a large error in measuring that angle. The important thing is Aristarchus recognized that the sun was a much larger object than both the Earth and the moon. Um, another very important um, Greek uh, astronomer was Hipparchus, but uh, uh, made many measurements of, of stars and catalog stars. We still use some of his catalogs today. But as you can see, even with very crude devices, uh, the ancient Greek astronomers, uh, using just very simple measurements, learned a lot about the world around them. And that's very true with science. We can make very simple measurements and find incredibly important uh, properties of our environment uh, with them. Now, measurements. If we're making measurements, we have to standardize or calibrate our units.
we use standardized units. Standardized is, is just we, we want to all be on the same page. If I'm communicating with you, I want to speak the same language. If I want to communicate with measurements, with measured results, I want to use the same language of measurements. Now, originally, many of the systems that were developed in standardizing units were used more for the market. The British system, also known as the U.S. customary system, or the imperial system, used inch, foot, yard, mile for length, ounce, pound, ton for weight, uh, degrees Fahrenheit for temperature, and this was great for uh, selling objects, bartering objects, because all of these were very easy um, you know, measurements to, to calibrate. In fact, you didn't really uh, worry too much if you're a little bit in error, too high or too low, because everything more or less averaged out. It wasn't until measurements became very precise in science that this type of system where you had to convert back and forth became cumbersome and others started pushing for uh, more logical systems of units, such as the metric system. Now, the metric system is based on powers of 10. We use some base unit. We'll see that the base units that we use for distance is our meters. The base units that we use for um, time are, of course, seconds. The base units that we use for mass are grams. And we attach a metric prefix to it where each metric prefix represents a power of 10. Kilo represents a thousand times. So a kilogram, kilogram, is 1,000 times greater than a gram. Micro represents one one millionth. So a micrometer is one one millionth of a meter. They're very, very useful to convert back and forth because all you're doing is changing your power of 10 here. Now, the metric units, of course, have a prefix and they have a base unit. And we can come up with a huge number of different units for length, for mass, you know, for just about anything we want to measure. However, there's a subset of the metric system called SI. And SI units are one metric unit that we reserve to calibrate very precisely for some quantity or some dimension. So for instance, length, we have centimeters, millimeters, micrometers, kilometers, megameters, you can come up with all these other ones. However, only the meter is an SI unit. It's metric, but it's also SI. So SI is a subset of the metric system. Kilograms, we have micrograms, milligrams, grams, you know, metric tons, but only the kilogram is kind of unique because it actually has a prefix. Kilogram, you'd think that'd be grams, not kilograms, but the kilogram is the SI unit for mass. Seconds for time, and oftentimes we're going to call this the MKS system, not just the SI units, we'll call it MKS for meters, kilograms, and seconds. Amps are used for electric current, Kelvin for temperature. We can even put together more than one of these SI units to create compound SI units. Speed and velocity are meters per second. Acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. Later on, we'll see force is measured in newtons. Energy in joules, power in watts. And here, look at newtons, kilograms, meters per second squared. All of these are built from some of the base units that we saw on the previous page. Accuracy and precision, measurements are never perfect, they're never free from error. Accuracy is how close they are to the actual value. No device is going to be perfect, but if you could get uh, you know, as close to perfect accuracy as possible, you, know, you would be getting as close to the ideal as possible. Precision is a little bit different. Precision is how consistent your measurements are from one to the other. Okay, let's talk about the scientific method. Oftentimes you'll see the scientific method presented as a recipe for how, con how you conduct science. Now, it's more or less a philosophy. The idea is that you see something in nature that doesn't make sense. It's either something completely new that you've never ex experienced before, it's something old but you notice that 
your understanding is flawed. Something's going to take place that is going to make you realize